Hello, good morning, and welcome to the third webinar of the Fit for Food 2030 webinar series. And today's webinar is titled Transforming Our Food Systems Research and Innovation as an Enabler of the Farm to Fork Strategy. Um, my name is Chrissy Briley. I am the Deputy Coordinator of the Joint Programming Initiative, A Healthy Diet for a Healthy Life, which is also known as the JPI HEHL. With the JPI HEHL, we are part of the Fit for Food 2030 project, and I will be moderating today's session. Um, in this webinar, we will explore how research and innovation, as we advocate with the Fit for Food project, can act as an enabler for policy development, and of course today in particular, the Farm to Fork strategy. Before we get started, I have a couple of general announcements. Um, for those of you who are on Twitter, you can follow us on at SciFoodHealth, uh, which you should now also be seeing on the screen. And you can tweet about this webinar using the hashtags that you also see on the screen, which is hashtag Fit for Food 2030 or hashtag Food 2030EU. After the two presentations from our speakers that will be coming up, we will be running a live panel discussion and a live Q&A with representatives from DG Health, DG Agri, and DG Research. Uh, we're very happy to have those with us today, um, as well as our second speaker, Jacqueline Brousse from the VU University. You can submit your questions and comments in the Ask a Question field at the bottom of your screen. And uh, if you have a specific question for one of our speakers or the panelists, please be sure to write their name before all these webinars of Fit and Food are recorded and we will registration page and our website. Uh, without further ado, we will go to the first speaker. So I would like to introduce Anne-Laure Gasson. She is a policy officer at the DG of the recently published Farm to Fork strategy, which will be presenting for us today. The Farm to Fork strategy, which was adopted very recently by the European Commission, is at the heart of the European Green Deal. With the aim to create a fair, healthy, and environmentally friendly food system, the strategy will contribute to the Green Deal's ambition to make Europe the first climate-neutral continent by 2050. The Farm to Fork strategy is at the heart, uh, one of the core elements of the Green Deal. Sustainability, indeed, is a growth strategy. This is what our citizens increasingly demand, nutritious food which is healthy and is produced in a way which is respectful towards our planet. The strategy addresses comprehensively the challenges which are faced, uh, which our food systems face today, and defines a way forward for establishing a sustainable food system, recognizing the very close links that exist between healthy people, healthy societies, and healthy planets. The strategy is also central to the Commission's agenda to achieve the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. The Farm to Fork strategy equally is needed in this context of the COVID-19 pandemic to pave the way for a green recovery from this unprecedented crisis and ensure food security and long-term resilience of our food systems. And finally, it should be stressed that the Farm to Fork strategy is the beginning of a process with ample room for consultation and discussion with stakeholders, and hence the value of this meeting that we are having here today. Sustainable food systems for sustainable societies. Well, what are they? The overarching goal of the strategy is to establish such, such a system. And here you have a diagram adapted from the Food and Agriculture Organization um, schema for sustainable food systems and also taken from the uh, scientific advisory mechanism and their recent opinion on sustainable food systems. It's important to have in mind that sustainability does not only mean environmental sustainability, which is often what people have in mind, but also social and economic. And you have here the three dimensions. Uh, the economic dimension, including aspects such as jobs, income, a fair share of added value, in particular for primary producers. The social dimension, including healthier diets, vital rural and coastal areas and better animal welfare, and importantly, ensuring a just transition for those most affected by the shift towards sustainable food systems. And the environmental dimension, implying a food system which is in harmony with the environment, meaning lower greenhouse gas emissions, aiming to achieve zero pollution, 
enhancing biodiversity. And today it's fair to say that our food systems in the EU and, and worldwide are not sustainable. We need to redesign our food systems, which today account for globally nearly one third of, of greenhouse gas emissions, consume large amounts of natural resources, uh, result in biodiversity loss and negative health impacts, um, be that under or over nutrition, generate food losses and waste, and do not allow fair economic returns and livelihoods for all actors, in particular for primary producers. As we were preparing the Farm to Fork strategy, the world was confronted with the COVID-19 pandemic and unfortunately still is. This crisis highlights the need for a food system that is resilient, healthy and sustainable across all dimensions. It has reminded us of the importance of a robust and resilient food system, which provides sufficient supply of affordable food for citizens. It has made us even more aware of the close relations between our health ecosystems, supply chains, consumption patterns, planetary boundaries, show the importance of, a, of ensuring sustainable livelihoods for all, all those involved in the food value chain, um, including also those working closely with that chain, um, um, with, with producers, be they uh, food processors, retailers, other industries involved in logistics and transport of food are all of vital importance. And the pandemic has highlighted, the, has highlighted their role as well and the need to have good working and housing conditions. Food systems cannot be resilient to crises such as these if they're not sustainable. And the transition to sustainable food systems is a necessary foundation for a green recovery from the current crisis. What are the overall goals of this strategy? to reduce the environmental and climate footprint of the EU food system, strengthen its resilience, ensure food security, and lead a global transition to a competitive sustainability from farm to fork and tapping into new opportunities. But more specifically, what does this mean? What does a sustainable food system look like? Well, it's one that has a neutral or should have a neutral or positive environmental impact that should ensure food security and public health and importantly, that preserves the affordability of food while generating fair economic returns in the supply chain, ultimately making the most sustainable food also the most affordable. So these are the ambitions and where we are striving and striving to go. Now the strategy sets out also some quantitative targets in key areas concerning the use and risk of chemical pesticides, concerning reducing use of more hazardous pesticides, reducing nutrient losses and also reducing use of fertilizers, reducing sales of antimicrobials for farmed animals and in aquaculture, and achieving at least 25% of the EU's agricultural land under organic farming and a significant increase in organic aquaculture. The targets will also play an important role in the new common agricultural policy. Member states will have to consider these objectives and targets when designing national strategic plans under the reformed cap. But it should be noted that these aspirational targets, which are not legally binding targets, by the way, they, they would become so um, in the context of the evaluation of EU policies and their implementation, and of course, would be subject to impact assessment and public consultation in line with better regulation. But beyond these targets, quantitative targets, which are identified here, the strategy also sets out equally important objectives in other areas, even though um, quantitative targets have not yet necessarily been set. So how do we get, how do we develop such a strategy? How do we reach, how do we establish a sustainable food system? That's the big question. How do we, how do we reach these goals and concrete targets? Well, in fact, um, we need an integrated approach. There are very many actors, but equally important, many ideas. There is no one single idea, and it's certainly not the European Commission that has the one and only and best idea to achieve such a system. Of course, European policies play their part and are important in setting the direction, uh, but we need all actors on board. Uh, these are actors in the food chain, farmers, fishers, aquaculture producers, food companies, the retail sector, restaurants, but also other players that interface with those actors, provide support, financial support, banks, investors, advisory services, research organizations, knowledge providers, 
And policies are not only, of course, determined at EU level, but importantly, at national, regional, and local level. Cities, for instance, have a very important role to play in designing and in implementing concretely on the ground sustainable food systems together with their citizens who are at the core um, and who have an important role and voice uh, in determining the future of our food systems. I did not mention the international dimension, which is, of course, critically important, and uh, we'll come back to this. It's a very important part of the strategy. So many different actors, uh, many different governance levels requiring different tools, a mix of regulatory and non-regulatory tools, um, be that legislation, financial incentives, education, research and innovation, procurement, or voluntary commitments, which are very important of the actual actors in the food value chain. Moving on now to the action plan, um, the strategy proposes two overarching actions, and one is the establishment of a legislative framework for sustainable food systems, which would set a framework providing a comprehensive, comprehensive set of general principles and requirements for sustainable food systems, and this to ensure policy coherence um, at all levels of governance, and providing also uh, measures and indications on governance and ensuring collective involvement of stakeholders. In the light of the recent pandemic, um, the Commission also proposes in this strategy to develop a contingency plan for ensuring food supply and security in times of crisis, whatever the nature of that crisis, and including and reinforcing our current food crisis response mechanism in the EU. There are actions um, defined for each stage in the food supply chain and addressing each of the actors. Um, importantly, at the production level um, concerning agriculture, as mentioned, the reformed common agricultural policy will help farmers to improve their climate and environmental performance by providing tools and instruments um, to help them adopt more sustainable farming practices. The common fisheries policy will remain important as well as EU guidance to support member states in developing plans for sustainable aquaculture. In between farm and fork, a whole range of, of actors, uh, industry, retail, hospitality, food services, uh, business operators, um, and initiatives will be proposed there or are proposed there to stimulate sustainable practices. For instance, the development of a code of conduct for responsible business and marketing practices and launching initiatives to stimulate food re reformulation. Importantly, we need to all move and, and, and shift um, our dietary patterns, moving towards more healthy and sustainable food choices. And here, the food environment also plays a key role, and the strategy proposes initiatives, including, for instance, um, initiatives to promote um, the formulation, the composition of food products that are beneficial for the environment and health, and also how they are promoted in order to ensure um, informed choices by, by consumers. Uh, and food labeling here also will play an important role. The Commission will scale up its fight against food fraud to achieve a level playing field for operators and strengthen the power in this regard of control and enforcement authorities. The Commission will pursue its EU action plan to prevent food loss and waste. Um, in uh, following the results of the first EU-wide monitoring of food loss and waste levels, which should become available in 2022, the Commission will propose legally binding targets to reduce food waste across the EU. The Commission will also pursue its work on date marking. So this is the, the use of these dates that we find on food labels, used by and best before, and will revise um, EU rules on date marking in order to help um, better inform both consumers and operators in the food chain in order to avoid that foods past the best before date are not unnecessarily discarded. The Commission will investigate food losses and also mobilize action to promote the recommendations of the EU platform on food losses and food waste. So critical to informing uh, this strategy and supporting its development are um, enablers, so-called enablers, tools and instruments to help all actors in the transition to more sustainable food systems. Research and innovation are key here. Under the current research program, Horizon 2020, um, a specific call will be launched to address the Green Deal priorities. Under Horizon Europe, uh, some 10 billion euros will be dedicated specifically to areas ad addressed by the Farm to Fork strategy, food, bioeconomy, natural resources, agriculture, fisheries, aquaculture, and the environment. 
The Commission will work with member states to strengthen the role of partnerships, such as the EIP Agri. Technical and financial assistance from, will be provided through existing EU instruments, such as cohesion funds and the European Agricultural Fund for Rural Development. Digitalization is also critical, and here the Commission aims to accelerate the rollout of fast broadband internet in rural areas. The Commission will foster investment in the agri-food sector, and here the InvestEU Fund will help um, will be leveraged to help de-risk investments and facilitate the access of SMEs to finance. But we also need to accelerate the transfer of knowledge and transform learning into practice on the ground. And um, for instance, farmers have a particular need for objective tailored advisory services on sustainable management choices, and member states will need to scale up support to allow sustainable farm management. The Commission will propose legislation to develop a farm and sustainability data network to allow primary producers to monitor and also benchmark their performance, not only their economic performance, but also as regards environmental and climate objectives. Support will be provided to SMEs uh, by means of tailored solutions to promote new skills and business models. I mentioned earlier the importance of the international dimension. The EU acting alone certainly cannot achieve the transition to sustainable food systems. And the Farm to Fork strategy proposes to promote a global transition through a partnership approach in line with the objectives of the Sustainable Development Goals. The Commission will develop green alliances on sustainable food systems to respond to distinct challenges in different parts of the world. Through trade and international cooperation, bilaterally and multilaterally, the EU will promote uh, more sustainable farming practices, reduce deforestation, enhance biodiversity, combat illegal and reported unregulated fishing, and over time seek to gradually raise food sustainability standards worldwide. The transition to sustainable food systems provide benefits and opportunities for all actors, but food security and food safety will remain its cornerstone and will never be compromised. The EU aims to lead this global transition, putting our food systems on a sustainable path to protect our planet and to protect future generations. The transition requires a collective approach. And here, we all have a role to play. Um, the Commission invites, uh, following the adoption and the publication of this strategy, all citizens and stakeholders to engage in a broad debate to make this policy come to life, to formulate a sustainable food policy at all levels and to promote and facilitate discussion in national, regional and local assemblies. The Commission invites, of course, the European Parliament and Council to endorse the strategy and contribute to its implementation. And the Commission, finally and importantly, will reach out to citizens on this strategy in order to encourage them to participate in transforming our food systems. Because at the end of the day, it's really down to all of us, each and every one of us, to make the Farm to Fork strategy a reality, to move towards sustainable food systems for the benefit of our health, for healthy societies, and a healthy planet. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for that presentation, and Lore. Um, we did receive some comments from you about poor sound quality at the start. We're very sorry about that, so we've tried to fix that. Hopefully it is now better. Um, before we go to the next speaker, just a reminder, if you have any questions or comments on our speakers, on the presentations, or for our panelists, uh, please submit them in the chat. Um, we now go to our next speaker, Professor Jacqueline Brousse, uh, who is a Professor of Innovation and Communication in Health and Life Sciences uh, at the Athena Institute at the Free University of Amsterdam, and she is also the coordinator of the Fit for Food 2030 project. Her presentation today is titled Farm to Fork Strategy, Research and Innovation as a Catalyst for Food System Transformation. Uh, it's a real pleasure of being here, especially because this important farm to fork strategy is center stage during this webinar. And for us, from Fit for Food 2030, this is a very important policy document. Um, our project strongly supports the observations and objectives of the farm to fork strategy, 
and I would like to do this presentation also very much linked to this strategy. Um, the food system faces many persistence problems with respect to both agricultural production, and there we see, for example, pesticide residues, uh, we have water scarcity and drought, there are problems in relation to animal welfare. On the consumption side, we see, for example, the, the malnutrition in some parts of the world, um, including low access to food, resulting in underweight. In the more affluent parts of the world, we see the other way around, where an abundance of unhealthy diets result in overweight and obesity. And what we have noticed is that these problems are very persistent. Uh, they are complex with many factors and actors involved, which makes them very difficult to solve, basically because they are embedded in the system. It's actually the system that's the problem. So we are now at a crossroad, actually, and that's why the farm to fork strategy is so timely. Um, we can decide to do business as usual, with only minor changes, but evidence piles up that this will be at the detriment of both people and planet. So we can also decide to go a second path, leading to a vision of a healthy, sustainable, resilient planet. However, there is growing consensus that we actually need to urgently transform our food systems if we want to achieve that. We also fully endorse the conclusion of the farm to fork strategy that research and innovation should play a key role in helping us to realize this second path. It can help in shaping more sustainable and healthy food systems. Research and innovation can act as a catalyst in various ways. First of all, it could create a sense of urgency by deepening our understanding of the problems and their consequences. This is important to raise awareness among a wide variety of stakeholders, and it could facilitate policy change and investment. Second, research and innovation can act as a catalyst by identifying breakthrough innovations, leverage points that could really get things going, both technical and social innovations. And a third role is to better understand the food system dynamics I mentioned before that actually problems are very much embedded in the system, so understanding food system dynamics is very important. However, much as research is done to solve problems in our food systems, and there are many examples to do that, but at the same time, we find that many of the innovations don't flow into society smoothly we face problems. And actually, this is where we would like to um, add to the fit for food strategy, or I mean the food, the farm to fork strategy, because there's not much attention to this. Actually, the track record of research is not doing so well. Um, first of all, we see in general low, low, low rates and levels of adoption much of the research results are shelved. If they do find their way into society, often we see that scaling up hardly takes place or at a very slow pace because embedding in existing structures turns out to be difficult. And if adoption and scaling up does take place, we often see unforeseen side effects occurring which reduce the overall effectiveness. So, why is the role of RNI as problem solver not living up to its expectations? Well, first of all, turning to evaluation studies, we see that the linear approach that is taken in much of the research is uh, causing this relatively poor performance. Solving problems by breaking them down into solvable Subproblems, which is often the case nowadays in, in research, and then having a sequence of understanding the problem, doing the research, and then handing it over to society to implement it, is actually causing 
what we would call the implementation gap. And so um, we need to change something about this traditional linear approach. So let's delve, it dive into this a little bit deeper. Um, basically, there is what we call a double complexity. First of all, the problems in the food system are very complex. They are multi-layered, multifactorial. But secondly, they manifest themselves in a complicated context. For instance, as an entry point for food system transformation, a change in food consumption practices is often envisioned. So people need to eat more diverse, less junk food, less meat, etc. In other words, we need a shift to healthy and sustainable diets. However, changing dietary patterns is notoriously complicated. It is not just about individual behavior, it's about biological and cultural factors, such as genetic makeup and beliefs. It's about the broader socio-cultural drivers, such as poverty and infrastructure. But it also involves the food environment factors, such as the abundance of cheap junk food outlets and marketing, and food supply chain factors, such as monocultural production and processing by large multinationals. So research and innovation thus needs to take into account all these different factors at different levels in this total environment. So single issue strategies will be unable to solve complex food system problems. Only by chance, it's once in a while might, but in general, this is not the approach to take. Experts are increasingly calling for research that goes beyond a focus on only food production or consumption and takes into account all these middle elements like processing, packaging and transport, taking into account the interconnections, the feedback loops, the synergies and trade-offs. So there is an urgent need to understand the behavior in the system so that we can anticipate that behavior and strategize for realizing co-benefits and addressing trade-offs. We can then act more effectively, and this is actually what we call system thinking. And that's what we from Fit for Food think is a very important prerequisite for research and innovation to be effective. System thinking is a way of looking at the world, how the world works, that is markedly different from the traditional reductioni the, oops, reductionistic analytical view. It's a school of thought that focuses on recognizing interconnections between parts of a system and looks at it and synthesizes it to, to a whole. Um, taking into account all these different aspects, going beyond it and designing and implementing innovations, that is the way to proceed. So, we need to adopt a food systems approach to research and innovation. Uh, but we still need to take it one step further. Um, embracing complexity, well, it requires courage. It requires an open mind to other disciplines. And it requires interdisciplinary collaboration, as well as collaboration with a lot of stakeholders. Because to fully understand um, the many social and cultural drivers. It requires input from professionals and end users, citizens, consumers. And so this brings us to the second prerequisite, active stakeholder engagement. We need to create tangible spaces where we um, have all these different stakeholders to engage and learn from each other and do joint problem solving. That means that we're then talking about inter and transdisciplinary research. So we have systems thinking and inter and transdisciplinary research. Um, now to create these tangible spaces, um, we need a research and innovation system that can do that. Huh? Uh, unfortunately, we see that there are barriers. And these barriers are, um, I, I would like to highlight five barriers. 
Uh, first of all, we see that uh, the RNI landscape is rather fragmented in separated disciplines and sectors. Um, next, we see that actually, especially civil society, consumers, farmers, citizens, so they are not so much involved yet in research and innovation. Um, so, research is not really transdisciplinary, and one of the reasons for that is that there is not much support in R&I funding programs and from academic structures. Um, it's mainly focused on outputs such as many publications in high-impact journals, instead of interacting with a wide variety of stakeholders, particularly something like citizens. Another thing is that the private sector investments in research and innovation are not so much focused on food system transformation. Okay, there are many topics, but not so much the food system transformation. And apart from the private sector, actually the public funding programs don't do so much better in this respect. Uh, we see a lot of open calls instead of system-oriented calls. So food and nutrition and, and food systems transformation is not a focal point. Uh, so, also here we can say, again, uh, if we go business as usual, actually it's not very likely that research and innovation will actually contribute very effectively to future proving our European food system. So, actually we need a double system transformation. We need to change our uh, food system as well as our RNI system. And that's actually the core focus of um, the Fit for Food project. We are focusing on food system transformation by changing the research and innovation system. And in that respect, it supports explicitly supports the at this moment the food the so-called food 2030 policy framework of the EEC. This translated in our fit for food project in setting up several tangible spaces, the so-called food 2030 platform. Here we bring together a wide range of stakeholders at different levels. First we have established 11 policy labs in different European countries where stakeholders jointly work together. The aim is to develop integrated policies on research and innovation. Second, we have established city labs in 14 European countries. Here, stakeholders develop joint visions on what a future-proof food system would look like and how to get there. We have also established an EU-level think tank consisting of 15 stakeholders active in a wide variety of international arenas. The think tank plays an important role in linking the different levels. And it also provides advice to the European Commission and especially the Food 2030 program. And one way of communicating the advice is through policy briefs. And I would like to close my presentation by highlighting one of these policy briefs. Um, and that's one is that, that is specifically the one that provides advice on the farm to fork strategy of the European Commission. And it focuses on the need for an improved research and innovation governance. So other ways of how research and innovation is commissioned. Now, first, the first advice addresses the problem that the current policy landscape for commissioning RNI does not adequately support systems thinking. As I mentioned before, research programs are scattered across different sectors and disciplines. In contrast, in the new governance context, RNI programs should actually transcend sectors and disciplinary boundaries and actively engage stakeholders throughout the research innovation process. So that means that programs should explicitly support this new RNI approach. Secondly, it is important to realize well-targeted investments. It is not just about process, but also about achieving certain outcomes. So with research, we want to achieve something. So that means research agendas. Agendas on both technological 
and social innovations and that could act as leverage points for food system change. This requires careful targeting and co-creation. So a co-creation process in which shared visions, goals and action plans are formulated. Now, last but not least, um, the success of the new RNI approach depends on complementary investments in research, in, uh, in education and training. Given the novelty of the approach, most researchers and professionals have not been trained in system thinking and stakeholder engagement. It is thus very important to build capacity. More financial resources should therefore be invested to support learning, not just in schools, and universities or other educational institutions, but also the training of professionals, perhaps even on the job. Realizing this new research innovation governance, yeah, we foresee a very important role for funding agencies who could take up the role as innovation brokers. They can act as catalysts, setting up targeted programs that supports the system thinking and stakeholder engagement. And we really very much hope that the Farm to Fork strategy in a next publication will develop such an innovative research innovation governance framework. So as to ensure that research innovation can really live up to its promise and contribute to the much needed food system transformation. Thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks for your presentation, Jacqueline. Um, so if you have a question for Jacqueline about her presentation, please remember to ask it via the chat function. Uh, we've already had quite a few questions coming in, so that's great. Uh, we'll get to those in a little bit in the Q&A session. Because uh, now that we have seen both of our presentations, I would like to open the space for the live discussion. We have, uh, as I said, we have received some of your questions. We'll get to those in a little bit. Um, if you have a specific question for someone, please remember to add their name. Um, today for the panel discussion, we are very happy to have with us uh, Henk Vesthoek, who is a policy officer at DJ Health and Food Safety. We have Luis Vivas Alegre, who is a policy coordinator at DG Health and Food Safety. We have Kerstin Rosenau, who is the head of unit for research and innovation at DG Agri. We have Karen Fabri, who is the Deputy Head of Unit for the Bioeconomy and Food Systems at DG Research and Innovation. And we have our previous speaker, Jacqueline Brousseau, also with us on the panel today. Um, a very warm welcome to all of you. So before we go to the questions from the audience, I would like to start with posing a few questions to our panelists. Um, starting with a question to you, Kirsten. Uh, I would like to ask you, what do you see as the role of RNI in the Farm to Fork strategy? And how will Horizon Europe contribute to the objectives of the Farm to Fork strategy? So thanks uh, a lot to the Fit for Food 2030 Consortium for organizing this and inviting me as a representative for DG Agri. And thanks, Chris, here for the pertinent question. So research and innovation are really key drivers in accelerating the transition to sustainable, healthy and inclusive food systems from primary production to consumption. Uh, RNI can really help uh, to develop and test uh, solutions, overcome barriers and undercover and new uh, market opportunities. For farmers, if we take the farm to fork uh, targets really seriously, that will be very heavy and we really need RNI uh, to help find solutions there. Then it's maybe worthwhile to mention that it's not only Horizon Europe. We have ongoing under Horizon 2020 already 300, 300 projects around 2 billion euro that we've been investing. An additional Green Deal call will come up, which will help with uh, demonstration and also technology, which can be quick to help us towards the targets to farm and food. Uh, so there's already a lot going on. Uh, then under Horizon Europe, there will be an additional 10 billion. This is what we've proposed. We don't know what comes out of the MFF negotiation finally, but this will really help us uh, to enable producers to help them to manage natural resources, land and sea in a sustainable manner, and also to empower consumers to choose sustainable, healthy diets. The actions will thus drive the pro progress towards the targets set in the farm to fork. 
Horizon Europe programming reflects the importance of a systems approach uh, to research and innovation. Out of the seven intervention areas, there are three, agriculture, forestry, and rural areas, seas, oceans, and inland waters, and food systems that cover really the whole spectrum from primary production to consumption. Moreover, R&I under all the intervention areas will be aligned towards some cross-cutting impacts. So we've not tried to work in our little corner. We've tried to really work cross-cutting. So climate neutrality and adaptation to climate change, prevention and restoration of bioeconomy and ecosystems, sustainable and circular management and use of natural resources, food and nutrition security for all within planetary boundaries, sustainable, balanced and inclusive development of rural and coastal areas, and also governance model across everything enabling sustainability. So just a few examples on key R&I priorities under Horizon Europe towards Farm to Fork. So first of all, R&I within the mission soil health and food will contribute to speeding up action for sustainable soil management, ensuring also that soils continue to deliver food and vital ecosystem service under changing climatic conditions. Then there will be a new knowledge uh, and innovation agroecology uh, devoted partnerships in primary production through dedicated partnership on agroecology living laboratories. This will also contribute to reducing dependency and the use of pesticides, antimicrobials and excessive fertilization. And other key RNI in areas including climate neutral and resilient farming, plant animal health, agrobiodiversity, including general resources, the microbiome, quite important, food from the oceans, urban food systems, and alternative proteins. And there's also a Horizon Europe partnership for safe and sustainable food systems. So that will put in place R&I governance mechanisms, engaging member states and food system actors from farm to fork for innovative solutions uh, in the area. So uh, what I think is important also, okay, we do R&I, but in the end, I mean, we will not be successful if we don't get this to the farmers or in other cases uh, to the consumers or the industry to apply this. So for our area, for the production, we have the European Innovation Partnership on Agricultural Productivity and Sustainability, so the EIP Agri, which really boosts the collaboration of individual farmers with researchers on the field, uh, with advisors, uh, consumers, business representatives together to apply the solutions that we develop using also the multi-actor approach. And then I think it's also important uh, to see that um, uh, there is a knowledge and uh, innovation system system which involves all the actors in the area of agriculture uh, where they come together from advice to production and uh, where we can actually strengthen that also advisory services will contribute to apply our research and innovative solutions that we have um, developed together. So that's it, Christy, that I wanted to say on the topic. Great. Thank you, Kirsten, for kicking off the discussion there. Yeah, and also uh, also great that you were able to highlight those those cross-cutting aspects, which we think are really important, of course, about the farm to fork strategy and uh, the related R&I. Um, for the next question, I would like to move to DG Health. Um, so, uh, Luis Vivas Alegre and Henk Vestuk, um, what could be, according to DG Health, the most important aspects that need to be taken into account by the RNI community in order to increase their impact on the food system transition? Luis or Henk, is, is either of you there? Ooh, I'm afraid Sorry, I'm we here, can... Oh, I was hi, hi, Hank. Hi, Hank. Uh, hi. Did you hear the question? Um, yes, I heard the question. Thank you very much for this question, uh, Chrissy, and uh, for having invited uh, colleagues from the from our from our GG to answer this question. Um, I think the opportunities offered by research and innovation from Sante's policy perspective are from three different angles. Uh, the first one is from impact-driven design of uh, Euro Horizon Europe, which is very important, so also connected to what Kirsten said, it has to arrive at the farm level. Uh, the second point is from the need to foster preparedness of food systems to face future challenges, as also highlighted by the COVID. I mean, we cannot foresee every 
uh, event, but we have to be prepared. The food system has to be resilient to be, to be able to cope to the different challenges. And the, the third part, which is very important for us as policymakers, is also from a regulatory science perspective, this bridging from science to policy making. Um, so firstly, the in this impact-driven design of Horizon Europe can benefit from the EU food regulatory framework, where innovators would take into account the requirements for reg regulatory approval of products and a process that seeks to assess the EU to the EU markets. And at the same time, um, the Horizon Europe and 2020 is very important in promoting a multi-actor approach and also to include citizens' engagement at the level of research. And secondly, uh, with regard to the preparedness for food system facing future challenges, um, like I said, it's all very important to make the food system more resilient and more robust. And I think new knowledge and tools may be needed um, to contribute to this. And this is really, I think it's really ask out of the box thinking and uh, innovative way of approach. And finally, uh, research innovation activities are important to support regulatory science in order to foster the solid science-based foundations of the EU food, food chain policy making. In this respect, also the role of EU agencies is very important. And in some cases, these agencies also require specific research in order to bridge from research outcomes to policy making. Um, and by investing in new knowledge, um, this is important to support risk assessment and food chain uh, uh, developments in the EU food system in order to protect human health, and animal health and welfare, plant health and the environment, and at the same time ensuring uh, that the most sustainable food also becomes the most affordable. Thank you. Hey, great! Thank you, Hank, for those uh, for those comments, and I think they uh, they line up also very nicely with uh, what was said during the presentation of Jacqueline about sort of um, doing R and I via uh, multi-stakeholder involvement. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I think that we are now going to kick off the Q and A with our audience um, by asking you a few questions via Slido. Um, so if you want to go to the screen, if um, if I'm correct, you are all seeing two screens um, in the webinar browser. So um, if you have the uh, webinar on full screen, please go back to a smaller screen. And then next to the presentation screen, you will see the uh, Slido. And I'm just waiting for the Screen to, oh yeah, um, so you see the QR code uh, that you can use to go to the Slido webpage or you can just go to slido.com and then the password is Fit for Food 2030 that you see on your screen there. So to enter Slido, Fit for Food 2030. Give you all a few moments to join us on Slido. Are we going to the first question? Yes, there we have it. Um, so the first question to our audience, is the food system approach, so, and thereby we mean the holistic multi-stakeholder approach, part of your national R&I programming and investment? So we'd really like to get your questions there. You can um, answer, you can, you can give multiple answers. And in case you uh, have other, we're of course very curious to hear what that other is, so you can elaborate maybe a bit via the chat function. This is always the fun part, seeing the questions come in live as we go. So the answers there are uh, no, it's not part of our national R&I programming and investments. 
Yes, it is mentioned in the relevant R&I strategies, which, you know, might imply that it's there in theory, but not so much in practice yet. Um, yes, there are or will be specific calls for proposals on the food system. Yes, the food system approach is an integral part of calls for proposals that relate to the food chain. Yes, the food system approach is part of the communication and implementation of our R&I activities and, of course, the other category. And again, if you have other and you would like to elaborate on that, we'd, uh, we'd love to hear what that is. Please use the chat function for that. And imagine that you might need to have a little bit of a think about this. So let's stick with this question for a few more moments. Be very interested in your responses to this, in how far the food system approach or in how far you feel the food system approach is part of your national RI programming. Slowly creeping up still. Okay, thank you all very much for that. Um, so yes, the, the the top answer at the moment is that it is mentioned in the relevant R and I strategies, which you know, which is a good beginning. It means there is awareness. And I think we will now go to the next question. So how could the R&D sector increase its impact on food system transformation according to you? And we have a few options for you there, and we'd like to give you your top two answers. So according to you, which two strategies or which two actions would be key in order to increase the impact of the R&D sector on the food system transformation? And the answers that we have there for you, or the options we have there, are improve the connection between research and policy development at the agenda setting phase. Number two is improve the uptake of research outcomes of R&I projects and programs in policy development. So those first two are really about strengthening that policy science interface. And number three is improving the framework conditions for interdisciplinary research. So stimulating the collaboration really between research disciplines making sure there are the right conditions, the right incentives to collaborate. Number four is improving the framework conditions for transdisciplinary research, which is really that multi-stakeholder approach. So uh, also what we call within Fit for Food the responsible research and innovation, which we advocate. And number five, improve the translation of research results to innovation. So really trying to bridge that gap that there sometimes is between research and innovation working towards more innovation and market uptake. Number six, the dedicated use of knowledge brokers within R&I projects, which is also something that Chapeline talked about in her presentation, and of course, the other category, and again, please elaborate in the chat function if you would like to. Just you can give two answers. Just give you a short moment because we're at 23 we had 25 answers just now and now we're at 23 so i think we can we can get two more there we go and so the top answer is or the top response is really improving the framework conditions for interdisciplinary research okay that's interesting oh we're getting a bit a few more answers now that's good okay Thank you very much. I think we'll go to the next question. According to you, what are the key R&I needs, so topics and priorities, to accelerate the transition to a fair, healthy, and environmentally friendly food system from farm to fork? What are the key research priorities? And here you can just, we're going to make a word cloud, so you can just type in your answers. What are the most important things that need to be done in order to make that transition possible? We have some answers coming in. Food waste, I see there. So 
I presume that means doing something about food waste, combating that, rescuing food, which is along the same lines, through pricing, Let's see access to finance there. So finance, I think, to, to help actors in that transition. This is great. We have 15 responses so far. What are the key R&I needs, the key topics and priorities that are needed, according to you, to accelerate the transition? How can we achieve the farm to fork strategy and the ambitions of the farm to fork strategy? relationships between actors, multi-actor. Yeah, taking into account, of course, the planetary boundaries. True pricing seems to be the, the one that's mentioned the most so far. We have something about the urban-rural connection. Quite a bit about pricing and financing. Okay, some front runners there. So I have a few answers coming in. With a view to the time, I think we're going to move on. But thank you all very much for giving us those inputs. Again, if you want to comment any further, you can do so via the chat function. Um, but for the next question, we would also like to get um, some, some recommendations from you. This is also really meant to you know, collect and gather your input as stakeholders and uh, as actors in the food system. So the question is how to best implement the food systems approach in EU funded R&I. According to you, what are your recommendations and ideas for that? Um, so we will leave this last question in the Slido open as we continue with the Q&A session. So you can just continue for these last 15 minutes to put your recommendations and ideas in there, and then, uh, and then we'll take those with us uh, so you can continue to do so. Um, having said that, uh, we will now move on to take some of your questions that you have been sending in during this webinar. And um, Karen and or Kirsten, are you there? Yes. <clears throat> Karen yes, here. I am. <laughs> Hi, you're both there. Good, good to have you. Um, so uh, Karen Fabri from uh, DG Research there and Kirsten Rosano from DG Agri. Um, a question that came in is, farmers and food industry are severely hit by the economic fallout of COVID-19. A very topical question. Will the farm to fork strategy include economic, uh, green recovery for companies who can't invest in the coming years. Who would like to respond first to that? So as um, the, the I... audience has already heard me, I will leave uh, Karen the floor first. Great. All right. Uh, thank you. And apologies for the uh, for the blip. I suddenly disappeared and was not able to connect. Uh, happy to be with you uh, now, and thanks for the invitation. So, with respect to the recovery package, um, well, we do believe that research and investments in food systems research and innovation can also provide some very promising avenues uh, for the next generation EU recovery package um, that will deploy a reinforced EU budget to help repair immediate economic and social damage brought by the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, to basically kickstart uh, the recovery and prepare for a better future. Uh, for example, we see that food services are, have been, uh, like restaurants, uh, have been severely affected by by the COVID uh, lockdowns. How can we how can we use research and innovation uh, to get them back on track? Um, not just uh, how they were before, but how can we get them back on track in a much more green and circular and healthy way? so that uh, um, they can provide um, uh, uh, services and, and, and to, to um, 
with respect to a, a greener future. Um, and we are now exploring within our own services how, what role research and innovation can play to foster a green and innovative recovery. So that's just one example. And I think that within the, the context of the recovery, how can we um, establish some, some initiatives that will also deliver, again, co-benefits. So we know that we need to deliver on environmental aspects, on climate aspects, on health aspects, on inclusion aspects. How can we rethink our future so that all of these dimensions can be put forward? Thanks. Thank you very much for that, Karen. Yeah, I recently heard the slogan, uh, building back better. Uh, so very much in that spirit. Um, as farmers are specifically mentioned here, Kirsten, would you uh, perhaps also like to comment? Yeah, exactly. Um, so maybe to 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 switch on first, say a little bit something about R and I. I think what the crisis has brought is that all the instruments they are now um, kind of relooking uh, that are developed for the future. How can we help in the future avoid such crisis? or how can we now deal with recovery. For instance, as DG Agri is in charge of one of the, the secretariats uh, of one of the missions, one of the big new instruments, and I can see that from the other missions as well, all they really look at now, okay, what kind of research portfolio of the future can we develop, for instance, in our area with soil, soil-borne uh, diseases, uh, foodborne zoonoses and things like that, they now get a different uh, focus uh, in, in the research instruments. And I know that for the other missions as well. Then with regards to the farmers, yeah. I mean, they are hit as well by the crisis and there is economic uh, recovery package, quite a big one, an additional one for the farmers as well to help cope. But I mean, what we have to pay attention now that this recovery is also green and sustainable. So, I mean, we have to really much stronger than before see how can we link the economic aspects of this recovery with the sustainability aspects of the recovery. And that will be a challenge. Huh? So, because the, the, the idea is not only to... Uh, uh, re-establish the production to see cover for the losses, but also to see in the future uh, that we don't uh, miss out on the sustainability just now, because this is really key. And there we're trying to see how we can, um, especially for the production sector, where I've already said in my inter intervention, where it's really key if we want to be serious about pesticides, fertilizer targets that we have, that we, we, we help, we invest in that area. And we have uh, uh, 7 billion of extra funds and we will make sure, because one of the questions was also the cap, how can it be that this will actually be contributing to a green recovery? And I think that that was the most important remark I wanted to make here. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Some, some promising uh, uh, foresights there. Um, we have had quite a few questions about true pricing, and we also saw, saw it coming back in the Slido. Um, Hank, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hank is there. Great. Uh, so maybe you, you would, might uh, want to take this question. Um, so uh, one of the questions was, there is a huge need for true pricing on the food market. Uh, true price, that includes hidden prices in all food trade exchanges. Um, it's quite a long question. All negative externalities should be supported by the market and not by current poor producers and future generations. Support to farmers and producers could be transformed in support for consumers in order to pay the true price of food. Um, Hank, how would you respond to that from uh, the perspective of DJ Health there? Um, yes, thank you for the question. It's an interesting um, uh, subject, but also a very difficult subject. There are many sides to it. Um, um, in the farm to fork strategy itself, uh, pricing and also the affordability of food is uh, mentioned uh, several times. And of course, on, on one hand, we want to have food affordable for everybody in our society. There are still many people, even in Europe, that are food insecure. And on the other hand, we want to have a good price also for farmers and also to be able to, to, to enable farmers to adopt more um, sustainable production practices, which might raise the food prices. So there's a big, there's a balance to strike there. Um, and the, the farm to fork strategy itself says that, um, that the end, uh, the most sustainable food must also become the most affordable food. 
uh, but this is quite a challenge to reach there. So I think there's also a need for research and innovation uh, with that respect. But the true price, uh, I think that the concept is in general terms exp uh, understood that the the prices for the consumers becomes higher. Uh, and I'm not sure whether this is the way to go. I think it's much more important that it finally the production practices become more sustainable, for example, with uh, higher animal welfare standards or more biodiversity, for example. And that will indeed lead to higher prices to consumers. But there's a, there's a different mechanism than, than raising the prices for consumers directly, because then the question is, what do you do with it? extra money? Uh, for example, if you take... Um, uh, for uh, coffee or cacao, for example, if you would raise, if you would say, well, the coffee is produced with too low wages, then we we express this in higher prices for consumers. But how do you can then transfer this money back to the um, to the farm laborers in, in in Africa or in South America? So then the question is, I think the import the mechanism is much more important to raise the production standards and to raise fair prices for producers, and that will translate automatically in higher prices for certain products, at least at the consumer level. So I hope this answers the question. But like I said, it's still a difficult question, so I think there's also a need for uh, more clarification from research and innovation with this respect. Okay, Hank, thank you very much. Um, Chrissy, may I quickly say a quick word on that, just to say also that we yes, are exactly developing an R&I roadmap uh, on this. Uh, so this is one of the key aspects that we have identified on, uh, in the area for, for Horizon Europe-related research on the different models, uh, on the different aspects. As Hank was saying, we need R&I. Absolutely, we do. And we intend to take this forward uh, under under the research and innovation agenda of uh, Horizon Europe, huh? just as an as a supplementary information. Yeah, thank you, thank you for jumping in there, Kirsten. That's very good to hear. Um, the next question, uh, I think we have one for Jacqueline. Jacqueline, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Great. Um, so. After your presentation, I think uh, that might have uh, elicited this question. It is, what concrete strategies and actions can be deployed to ensure increased involvement of consumers, citizens, and local communities? Ah, that's a very good question. Um, that I didn't touch upon that much uh, in my presentation. Um, so it, it's better, very much about methodology. How, how do you do it? And um, luckily, the last couple of years, quite a lot of research has taken place of how can we uh, involve consumer citizens and local communi communities in research. And um, I would very much like to refer to the RRI Tools project and the website uh, of RRI Tools. So RRI is the re Responsible Research and Innovation, because they have collected a lot of methods for that. Um, Alternatively, I would advise to look at websites that portray methods uh, for participatory action research. They are also having a lot of methods for this. But I think the most important challenges for the years to come is particularly to, to prevent that many of the um, joint activities with consumers, citizens, and local communities are not one-off events but are going to be a structural component throughout. And I think for that we need more institutionalization, said before, in, in funding uh, programs, but also support by, by universities, research organizations. It's really becoming a structural thing. I think that's, Thank um, you. I hope this, this sufficiently answers the question. <laughs> Thank you, Jacqueline. Yeah, that, that's very key, of course, to how to get that true multi-stakeholder involvement, also including consumers and citizens. Um, going to the next question, um, we have a question here. Uh, with research and innovation, there are no criteria like precaution. What about the precautionary principle? Um, maybe, Karen, you would like to take that question? 
Uh, yes, thanks, <clears throat> Chrissy. Um, so, with respect to to precaution, uh, we we think that the the, the the approach of responsible research and innovation is is key there because it provides a framing to really better anticipate and to be reflexive uh, within projects at their outset. Uh, what could be the possible impacts of the approaches, technologies, innovations, uh, findings that, that they could be uh, coming up with? And also, in, in addition to, to this notion of anticipation, uh, it's through re responsible research and innovation, we encourage multi-actor engagement processes. Again, that bring in also as much as possible civil society, because it's only by engaging through through um, through these types of um, multi-actor processes that we can ensure that what comes out of research and innovation is um, has acceptability uh, of society uh, at it, at its core. So um, precaution is about uh, thinking ahead what could happen, and trying as much as possible to mitigate what could be negative uh, impacts and um, and seeking to, again, um, deploy co-benefits. I stop there. Hey, thank you, Karen, very much. Is there any other of our panelists who would like to uh, comment on that also? On the yes, hi, about Luis. Luis here from the Sante. Apologies if I have had recurrent connection problems and I would like to thank you again for, for inviting the colleagues uh, from the and uh, to this very interesting webinar. I think in the context of the precautionary principle, Karen has uh, very nicely described the research and innovation perspective. And there I would like to take you back uh, to, to the main uh, angles that Hank presented before on Santer's perspective on how to uh, leverage the opportunities over, offered by research and innovation uh, for policy making. There, if we look at the context of regulatory science, it is indeed uh, where research and innovation can provide uh, the opportunities to foster scientific developments, to, to bring new data, to reduce uncertainty in the risk analysis process in order to uh, provide for better informed uh, decisions in policy making. So uh, the, the precautionary principle is indeed uh, very uh, well connected in this context as an opportunity for research and innovation to continue contributing through regulatory science to foster solid, solid science based foundations of the EU food safety system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lewis, for those uh, additional comments. Uh, we are nearing the end of our webinar. I think we still have time for one question, uh, if you are uh, willing to face the challenge of answering it rather briefly. Um, I think this one is to Karen again. Uh, the FU 2030 framework has been advocating a systems approach to R&I. Of course, what is needed now to improve food systems R&I governance and foster systems change to deliver co-benefits? So it would be great to hear from you about that uh, as some closing uh, as the closing remarks. Thanks, Chrissy. So uh, FU2030 provides a vision and po policy narrative that through well-governed and more systemic research and innovation policy, we can develop impactful solutions to the urgent, complex, and interconnected challenges inherent to food systems to be transformed uh, to respect planetary boundaries, provide healthy, safe, and nutritious food and diets for all, and to sustain a diverse, fair, and inclusive thriving economy. So the initiative, as you know, provides a framing and multi-actor engagement process within which R&I policy can flourish, giving rise to new knowledge, partnerships, and solutions that range from technologies to social governance and institutional innovation, as well as new uh, business models. So uh, with Food 2030, we've been applying a systemic approach to connect, scale up, and boost research and innovation investments to provide solutions for co-benefits. And uh, we know that um, we need to improve how we do and how we invest in both in science, research, and innovation, and this will be key to delivering greater impact. So research and innovation governance innovation uh, to foster systems change will be key and will require advances uh, to better understand our current food systems 
In other words, how can we measure research impact? How can we assess, analyze, and provide decision support tools that can help also with the science policy interface? How can we map and monitor food systems performance? And how can we communicate, disseminate, and um, encourage knowledge and information exchange? So this is what we consider um, the building a better science and science policy interface. Another issue that re reflects um, advances that we need to make in R&I governance include engagement. So how can we further raise food system awareness by engaging, for example, youth, um, by uh, fostering transition progress um, throughout the food system. Then another point is how can we better align? So how can we bring together uh, food systems, research and innovation, uh, programmers, funders, foundations, um, all keen on research and innovation? How can we align our research and innovation priorities to have more impact, to have more focus? How can we foster uh, increased education and training with respect to food systems? Uh, research and innovation and action. And then finally, how can we deploy? So can would we benefit from a food systems technology observatory, for example? How can we better develop, test, uh, and demonstrate um, food systems innovations, for example, through accelerators and living labs? So these are just some of the issues that we're very keen on bringing forward. Uh, that relate to research and innovation governance, which is really a cross-cutting leverage point, uh, which must be complemented, of course, by other more thematic research and innovation actions like uh, research and innovation on food waste, on dietary shift, on food safety and traceability, on urban food systems. And um, such an R&I governance pillar could be very much uh, at the heart of all other more thematic approaches that we would also like to explore within the context of the food system partnership uh, under Horizon Europe that we hope will be launched, we expect to be launched in 2023, and we will be um, uh, launching some preparatory work uh, between now and then. So I stop here. Many thanks for the um, uh, opportunity to take part today. Many thanks to you, Karen. Uh, some great, uh, important ideas there to close off this webinar with, because that's all we have time for today. Um, I would once again like to thank very much our speakers and also our panelists for the fruitful discussions. Uh, a big thank you, of course, also to our audience for joining us today, for sending us your, your questions and participating in the Slido. Um, please keep an eye out for the remaining webinars in this Fit for Food 2030 series. Uh, you can do so by subscribing to our newsletter and, of course, keeping an eye on the Fit for Food website and our Twitter. Uh, we, of course, invite you to engage with us on Twitter by using the hashtags you see on the screen and or tweeting at SciFoodHelp. And we very much look forward to hearing from you. Until next time.